Good evening, everyone. It is so uh, wonderful to see so many uh, familiar faces and friendly faces in this room because it's been a long time since many of us have been able to be together. So it's so good to see so many, so many uh, smiling and some smiling, some masked face faces. <laughs> so uh, 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 Kira Amstutz, uh, my uh, co MC here tonight, uh, are very honored to. Uh, serve as members of the Indianapolis Bicentennial Commission, which Mayor Hogsett created in 2018. Um, and we were proud uh, to serve uh, alongside our, our, our honorary co-chairs, Mayor, Mayor Peterson and Mayor Ballard, and our other commission members, Ted Boehm, Molly Chavers, John Kraus, and Shannon Williams. And the Bicentennial Commission began meeting actually here at the library um, at the invitation of, of Jackie Nitas. Um, and began meeting here in 2018 to plan events for 2020 and 2021. But of course, as, uh, as, as we all know, and as most uh, efforts and events across the city saw, uh, COVID struck and we weren't able to celebrate as much and as often as we would have liked. Uh, but there were still many major milestones uh, of the bicentennial that, were, that we were able to complete even in the midst of, of a global pandemic. And one of those, uh, one of those projects is the Digital Encyclopedia of Indianapolis. Kira and I uh, worked in, in the Indianapolis Mayor's Office together, and uh, the, the print version of the Encyclopedia of Indianapolis uh, literally was on the desk of pretty much everyone on the 25th floor. Um, uh, and, and I'm not exaggerating, because we all had that at our fingertips, and we used to huddle around the book to gain further clarity or context about the people and places and issues and events that have taken place over the last 200 years in Indianapolis. Uh, and the funny thing about time passing, though, is that when we were in the mayor's office back in the early 2000s, that book was less than 10 years old. <laughs> <laughs> You know, uh, yeah, I know, and we're a aging ourselves, uh, but it was less than 10 years old when we were using it, so it was actually pretty up to date at the time. Um, but as we all know, in the, in the close to 30 years since the encyclopedia was printed, so much has happened uh, uh, in our city, um, and, uh, and it's fantastic to think about uh, updating this important resource. It's something we actually talked about back in those days, but who could have imagined the explosion of, of digital technology and information that would shape this? Because I remember when we first started talking about this, we said, let's do another edition of the Encyclopedia of Indianapolis. Let's do a print, a print version. And of course, uh, the internet happened and Wikipedia happened and, and things like that happened. So the, the focus of this really changed into a digital encyclopedia of Indianapolis. Uh, and so uh, we're so happy to have all of you here this evening with us. And I'm going to turn it over to my co-host, Kira, to give a few comments as well. Well, lucky for you all, I'm not giving many comments. I'm giving mostly thanks. So part of uh, Steve's job and my job tonight is to keep the program moving. You have some really terrific folks to hear from who have been very instrumental in this project and also can help us see the potential in the future for this uh, amazing collaborative work. As Steve mentioned, I'm Kira Amstutz. I'm president and CEO of Indiana Humanities. I was a proud member of the Indianapolis Bicentennial Commission. And um, in, my, in, in my opinion, this is in true indie fashion, this project is, is collaborative. It's public, it's private, it's got everything mixed in, and it's been, um, I know for many of you, a, a major passion project over the past few years, and I can't wait for the community to get to see it um, after today. So my thanks uh, before we begin, and before I turn it over to John Helling, is I'd like to thank the founding partners in the project. If you're gonna do something this ambitious, you have to have a stable of partners that are ready, able, and willing to help, and these partners were from the beginning. Um, I'm gonna have you hold your applause until the end, but I do have a short list to read. The Polis Center, the Indianapolis Public Library, University Library at IUPUI, the Indiana Historical Society, Indiana Humanities, the University of Indianapolis Mayoral Archives, the Indiana Archives and Records Administration, the Indiana Historical Bureau, and Indiana State Library, Indiana Landmarks, and last but not least, Butler University. So let's give our partners a round of applause. Thank you. 
Now, we know that the partnerships will continue to grow over time, so if you're sitting in the audience tonight and you're thinking, wow, I really want to be on board with this, I'm sure that the folks at the library and David can tell you how to continue to be a part of it. Another quick thanks to the major donors. You'll see them in your program, but I think it's important for us to let them know how much we appreciate their support. Lilly Endowment, Inc., Allen Whitehill Clues Charitable Foundation, R.B. Annis Educational Foundation, the Indianapolis Foundation Library Fund, Nicholas Noyes Jr. Memorial Foundation, Jackie Nitas, and an anonymous donor. So let's give them a round of applause as well. All right, so in addition to those partners and funders, there were hundreds of contributors. I talked to many of you while we were hanging out in the um, atrium and I heard a lot of people say, oh, I was so excited to have gotten a chance to write about this, or oh, I got involved editing, or I submitted information. So if you had a hand in submitting some content, did some editorializing, maybe submitted photographs or documents that were part of this project, would you please raise your hand? Oh my gosh, <laughs> I figured as much. Thank you. Well, tonight you're gonna to get a preview of the new digital encyclopedia, and you're gonna hear from some of the people who've imagined and shaped this ambitious and essential project. So it's now my pleasure to introduce John Helling. He's the interim CEO of the Indy Public Library. He's gonna offer a welcome and acknowledge some of the other partners. John brings more than 10 years of experience in urban, suburban, and rural public libraries to his role as interim CEO. He's a Fulbright Scholar and author of Public Libraries and Their National Policies, International Case Studies. From personal experience, I know John is a generous community partner and collaborator. John? Thank you, Kira. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Central Library. I'm John Helling. I'm the interim CEO of the library. Um, I, I, want, I do want to welcome you to Central, which, of course, is one of our crown jewels of the library system, and we like to thank the city. Um, one of my favorite stories about this building, the old building, is that the architect, Paul Cray, after he designed it, he went home to his native France, and he got uh, caught in World War I and guided the construction of Central Library by let it, writing letters back and forth from the trenches of World War I which is just an amazingly different way of transferring information than we use today. Um, and when Evans Woolen uh, designed the addition to Central Library in the 2000s, which is, of course, where we're now sitting, he designed a building that highlighted the original 1917 building. And he said uh, he uh, was building a bridge, uh, excuse me, he, he, was, he wanted to honor the past while creating the future. I'm gonna make sure I got that right. Uh, and I personally like to think of it as taking the past with us as we move into the future which is, of course, the exact goal that the Digital Encyclopedia of Indianapolis has set out to achieve. Um, traditionally, you know, local history has been something that's been very difficult to access. You had to go physically to some place like the Indianapolis Special Collections Room up on the sixth floor, or the Historical Society, or the State Museum, where you had to look through physical materials, and if you were lucky, there was a bibliography, or if there was a finding aid, or something like that, but if you, if you didn't have those things, it was just a long, slow, rewarding, but sometimes tedious uh, process. Um, and in moving our local history online, what we're doing is making that history more accessible and also more usable. So, you know, going forward, you'll, you'll access resources like the encyclopedia or the library's many other digital collections with just, with just an internet connection. And we've designed these collections to be searchable in a way that should be familiar to, to anybody who's used a, a resource like Google. So we uh, have also left the door open behind us, so to speak. The great thing about this uh, resource is that communities can suggest additions to it, which is, of course has not been the case for, the, for print resources. You couldn't do that. So it's, it truly is the community's encyclopedia. So for all these reasons, the public library is very proud to be the ongoing caretaker of the Encyclopedia of Indianapolis. It's our responsibility to make available to our patrons the widest possible breadth of information and we take that responsibility very seriously. So thank you to all of our partners. Thank you to the Polis Center. Thank you to the Lilly Endowment. Thank you to everyone who supported this project and contributed to it. A lot of you are in the room. Thank you, thank you personally. And uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce the mayor of Indianapolis, Mayor, mayor Joe Hogsett. Well, indeed, good evening. And uh, it is 
Steve, so good to be together again, whether mask or unmask. Um, 27 years have gone by since the original printing and creation of the Encyclopedia of Indianapolis, and it has been a great way to discover more about our city. It has been a critical resource for residents, for visitors, businesses, and I can assure you even yet today, city officials, you might not think that people still have volume, printed volume of the, of the encyclopedia on their desks, but even yet today on the 25th floor of the city county building, you will find copies scattered among the offices. How, however, as Steve pointed out in his remarks, Indianapolis has long cried for a second edition of this valuable catalog of notable people, notable places, and notable events. Because whether it's that telltale Bank One logo on the cover, or the outdated entry for the Indianapolis International Airport. <laughs> we have a lot of catching up to do. For starters, the city is now 200 years old. In fact, the digital encyclopedia of Indianapolis, as Steve and Kira have underscored, was one of our official bicentennial projects. And while much of our 200th birthday uh, was relegated to a back seat because of the global pandemic, we are still rightfully proud of the legacy that is Indianapolis, that is our community, that is the city we call home. And the story that we have to tell about it is every bit as important, if not more so, than ever before. Today's unveiling of the digital encyclopedia shows our commitment, our collective commitment, to telling that story. Now, to be sure, some things about that story never change. For instance, it will always take 200 laps around the speedway to get to 500 miles. <laughs> Unless Mark Miles wants to tell me differently about plans out there. But other things about our, simply, or about our city simply reject the permanence of ink on paper. I mentioned the airport. But you can also add the Indiana Convention Center as another entry in need of updating, one which in a couple of years will require yet another update to include its upcoming expansion. Or take a look at the old entry for the Monon Railroad. <laughs> it outlines potential uses for the segment which had in 1994, just had its rails removed. For that entry, you'd need to include not only the Monon Trail, but the entire network of greenways that we've built since then, with more and more coming online next year and over the course of the coming years. Yeah, that deserves a round of applause. In short, Indianapolis is a city whose story won't sit still long enough to capture on a page. And that's why I am so grateful to David, the Polis Center, to my mentor, Bob Barrows, for IUPUI's part partnering with this enormous project. Thank you to the dozens and dozens of authors, contributors, volunteers, and more who made this project a reality. A reality. 
Today, the Indianapolis story, all 200 years of it and counting, is at your fingertips at IndyEncyclopedia.org. Let me repeat that. <laughs> IndyEncyclopedia.org. It shows us, simply put, who we are, who we were, and what we plan to become. Most importantly, the revised entry in the Digital Encyclopedia of Indianapolis that is in, in, entitled Indianapolis Mayor. <laughs> it shows all of you how so much younger I looked in 2015. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mayor, uh, for being here tonight, and thank you for your leadership uh, on this project and on the Bicentennial and many other things in our city. It's now my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for the evening. Uh, and when you think about the great families in the history of Indianapolis and of our community, the people that built this city from the ground up, the Walker family, descending from Madam C.J. Walker herself, is one of those founding families of Indianapolis. As such, our keynote speaker of Yulia of Bundles is no stranger to anyone in this audience or this community. And is someone I've personally looked up to for years, and not just because she went to one of the nation's great high schools, North Central High School, go and see. Um, <laughs> but Lelia had a trailblazing and award-winning professional career in her own right as a journalist, a producer, an author, but we also know her as the great-great-granddaughter of Madam Walker herself. She has kept her family's legacy in our city and country alive and has used Madam Walker's story to show Indianapolis residents just what is possible when intelligence and compassion and commitment and hard work and the ability to overcome adversity all coalesce into one person in one moment in time. In fact, her book, On Her Own Ground, The Life and Times of Madam C.J. Walker, was the inspiration for Self Made, the four-part Netflix series starring Oscar winner Octavia Spencer that premiered last year. Alilia also founded the Madam Walker Family Archives, the largest private collection of Walker photographs and memorabilia, and is brand historian for MCJW, a line of hair care products inspired by Madam Walker and manufactured by Sundial Brands. So in sharing Madam Walker's story, as, as Yelio has done so, so often uh, and, and for so many years, in telling her story, she's actually telling the story of Indianapolis. Uh, and, and a story of Indianapolis that, that many still don't know and still haven't heard of. So we're so happy that she could join us tonight virtually. So please welcome our keynote speaker, Ayulia Bendos. Good evening to everybody. Uh, wonderful to see Mayor Hogsett. Um, and I'm so glad to be with you, albeit virtually. I wish I could have been there for the reception to be able to hug people. And, uh, and I'm doing elbow bumps now <laughs> at this point. Uh, but this has been an Indianapolis week for me. Uh, on Tuesday evening, I was fortunate to be at Indiana Landmarks with some of you um, who are there in the audience tonight for a Rethink Coalition event where we talked about the history of Indianapolis neighborhoods, the impact of highway construction on historically black communities, and the opportunity to create a more visionary and respectful future for transportation in our city. Yesterday, uh, I was at the Marriott East with Mike Williams for the annual Library Federation Conference with librarians from across the state, uh, talking about the power of books and libraries, shaping communities, teaching accurate history, and inspiring young people. 
A few weeks ago, I was actually there in person at the library with Nichelle Hayes to celebrate the fourth anniversary of the Center for Black Literature and Culture. So having a chance to be a part of tonight's launch of the new Digital Encyclopedia of Indianapolis seems an appropriate way to continue collaborating with those of you who are raising awareness about the people who built Indianapolis and about the institutions that sustain us. Knowing the details of our history provides a foundation and a grounding for fashioning our future. As John Helling said about the design of the library, we are honoring our past while shaping our future. Like Mayor Hogsett, I still have my 1994 copy of the original two and a half inch thick Encyclopedia of Indianapolis. I was very proud to have been invited to contribute the essay about Madam Walker, but I'm especially grateful to all the writers and scholars whose entries on everything from the Senate Avenue YMCA and newspaper publisher George Knox to Monument Circle and the interurban trains provided information I needed when I was researching and writing the chapters about Indianapolis for my Madam Walker biographies. But the digital encyclopedia of Indianapolis is a game changer, not just for those of us who do research for our books. Even more important, it will be an easily accessible resource for students who are writing reports and who are trying to find out how they and their families fit into the fabric of the city. It will provide longtime residents of Indianapolis with facts about the corporations and organizations and institutions where they work, worship, and play. And it will introduce newcomers to the rich history of the city. I wish I'd had this resource when I was in school in Washington Township in the 1960s. Let me say that I received an excellent education at Grandview Elementary School, at West Lane Junior High School, and yes, Steve, at North Central High School. <laughs> But my high school history textbook gave a very inaccurate portrayal of American history when it came to black people in America. When Negroes were mentioned at all, it was within the context of slavery. It makes me cringe now when I reread the textbook, which I actually have, that says enslaved people were contented and rarely treated cruelly and were better off enslaved because they were clothed and fed. I'm happy to say that the Digital Encyclopedia of Indianapolis deals in truth rather than fantasy. Thankfully, the Digital Encyclopedia does a much better job of telling the story of Indianapolis with accurate information about communities that included members of my family and that includes the wide range of people who built the city. Young people can now learn these stories on their own. There are so many possibilities with the encyclopedia. I'm thinking that there should be a link on the website of Visit Indiana, Visit Indy, the Chamber of Commerce and the Economic Club of Indiana. It could be so, if I can be so bold, I'd suggest that it be included in the orientation packets for all new students at IUPUI, the University of Indianapolis and Martin University, for all history classes in Indianapolis and the surrounding communities, for all new employees at Eli Lilly, Cummins Engine, Salesforce, Ice Miller and Taft and the other major law firms. I very much appreciated the opportunity to be a part of the Digital Encyclopedia's Civic Advisory Committee, a group of almost 100 stakeholders who represent the rich diversity of the city. I asked Mike Williams to highlight some of the people who have made particularly meaningful contributions. And he mentioned Gorinda Hall, CEO of the Immigrant Welcome Center, who was born in New Delhi and who has her finger on the pulse of immigrant communities in Indianapolis. Jordan Ryan, an architectural historian whose work on redlining and community development has helped us understand the political forces that inform our current reality. And Dr. Edward Curtis IV for his work on the long and significant history of Indianapolis's Muslim community. There are many others who have made important contributions, but all of us who have served on large advisory boards know that there are always a few people who show up at all the meetings, who roll up their sleeves and who take the task to heart. It's a joy to now transition to the Digital Encyclopedia's editorial board 
which is led by Jim Madison, whose research and writing about Indiana and Indianapolis provide an honest depiction of our city and our state. He celebrates the inspiring moments and does not shy away from the challenging and frankly, sometimes ugly episodes. We need to understand all of our history to know how to move forward in the future. When I spoke with Jim a few days ago, we talked about the dedication of the members of the editorial board as people who bring expertise as scholars, journalists, authors, and community leaders. People who are devoted to accuracy, to facts, and to creating an inclusive telling of our city's organizations, institutions, and civic leaders. The editorial board welcomes community involvement because we know that the encyclopedia is only as strong as the accurate and credible information it provides. And finally, Mike Williams asked me to talk a bit about placemaking. Urban planners created this term placemaking in the 1990s as a way to talk about cities and community development, but it very much applies to the mission of the Digital Encyclopedia of Indianapolis. Those planners said that a great public space cannot be measured by its physical attributes alone. It must also serve people as a vital community resource in which function always trumps form. The Digital Encyclopedia aspires to present information about all those neighborhoods and communities that create the fabric that enriches our city, the people who make us strong. A credible encyclopedia celebrates the triumphs and acknowledges the challenges. Any corporation or organization during an annual assessment or a strategic plan would do exactly the same thing. What are the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats? Developers who build the best buildings are conscious of the communities they enter and the impact they have on those communities. They engage the people in those communities. The D Digital Encyclopedia provides a blueprint for understanding and engaging the stakeholders whose voices need to be heard. In the same way that developers and construction firms build houses and apartment buildings and office buildings, the Digital Encyclopedia strives to build community that is centered on the people and their needs and aspirations. A few guideposts from those who coined the concept of placemaking. The community is the expert, People who lack vision and creativity will tell you it can't be done and the work is never finished. And it is in that spirit that we celebrate tonight and that we prepare for the work ahead. There are so many people in our city's history who inspire us. There are so many institutions that have made this a welcoming place. So many visionaries who have invested in our past and our future and there is much work we still need to do. Thank you. of really having to understand our history as we attempt to move forward is really such an essential part of what we're trying to do here. And I also very much appreciate your enthusiasm for the project. I think you've helped really paint a picture of the many, many uses, the many voices, and also you've helped express the appreciation I know I feel and I think everyone who's up here on stage tonight feels for all of you who played a role in getting these stories told. So thanks again for being part of the evening and um, it is now um, my pleasure to introduce someone who didn't hear the words, this can't be done. This was a big project and it took someone who was willing to take on a big project to get us to where we are today. So it's my uh, honor now to introduce David Bodenhammer. David is the executive director of the Polis Center and a professor of history at IUPUI. 
For those of you who know David, you're aware that his areas of expertise are broad and diverse, and they include spatial humanities and spatial narratives, which are such fascinating fields. In short, as a digital humanist, he's been an innovator and a catalyst. He's collided data, maps, and knowledge in an effort to help communities thrive and to help us all make more informed decisions. David is the visionary behind the Encyclopedia of Indianapolis, both that 1994 print version that Steve and I lugged around, um, which was, again, I, I don't know if we've talked about this yet, but it was hailed as a national model for urban encyclopedias at the time. But he's also the, the visionary for this new digital version. David has also been an amazing fundraiser and catalyst in his years at IUPUI, attracting over $50 million in grant and external support over the past 30 years. But I might sum it up uh, like this. Really, without David's vision, his tenacity, and his generate and collaborative spirit, this project wouldn't have happened. In fact, I'll bet many of us are here today because of David. David, will you please come and join us and uh, give us a little sneak peek at the site? Thank you. Let's welcome David. Uh, thank you, Kara, for those undeserved words of praise. I don't, I, the, the praise actually belongs to everyone who is in this room and hundreds of people more because this encyclopedia, the digital version of the encyclopedia, or even the first version, would not have occurred without the significant contributions from members of this community who gave their knowledge so that, so that we can share it, so that we can learn from it, and so that we can act on it. You know, when we did the unveil the print version of the encyclopedia, about this time, 29 or so years ago, over at IUPUI, uh, Bob Barrows and I, Bob was the co-editor of that volume, uh, I, I remarked to Bob two things. One, I am glad this is over. <laughs> and secondly, I will never do anything like this again. <laughs> well, I've obviously lived long, too long to, uh, to uh, I should know better than that. but. Uh, I've done this one and I wanted to do this one because of two things, at least two things. One is I'm always convinced that Indianapolis has a wealth of talented people, people who have created the history of this community and their stories and their knowledge needs to be part of who we are. It needs to inspire us, it needs to shape uh, our understanding of our own selves and what we can do as a community. But the second thing is that a project like this is a uniquely collaborative project. It cannot be done by one individual. It cannot be done even by a small group of individuals. It takes the cooperation of institutions and individuals working together to learn from each other to create something that is special. I think and I hope when you see this tonight that you too will agree that what we have here is a special resource. But it's done because you have supported it and you have contributed to it. And for that, I am incredibly and eternally grateful. Uh, there are some people I want to recognize uh, who uh, Kira and Steve have named the people who and institutions who are important in funding the project the institutions who were the collaborating partners in the project. And when we say collaborating partners, it doesn't mean that we just gathered around a table and talked about and then planned something. It means that they have created on their own and for their own institutional purposes, digital archives that they open to us. And what is truly innovative about this product you're going to see is that they have made it possible for us to go in and reach and grab that content when we need it and to display that content in association with other content for that subject and then when people want to explore more about it we can direct them back to the institution from which the content came that is creating a, a, a network of digital information 
that will continue to grow over time and continue to inform our efforts. But beyond those collaborating partners, which served as a steering committee, and beyond the Civic Advisory Committee, uh, co-chaired by Sarah Evans Barker and by Rick Fusen and by Lacey Johnson, uh, and were, uh, I mean, where there were 75 members of this community who served this particular purpose, we have an incredible staff uh, that we were able to develop for this. The editorial staff, managing editor Beth Van Allen, associate managing editor Jody Verdurami, and Jess Fisher, who is our image editor. I'm sure, I know they're here. If they could just kind of raise their hand or stand up, I would appreciate that. So you could give them a hand. And they were assisted by a number of editorial and research associates throughout the course of the two and a half years to put this together. The, in addition, we had a great technical team at the Polo Center. Uh, headed by Neil Devadasan, who cannot be here tonight, he's our systems engineer, uh, but Matt Nowlin and Skip Comer, who you're going to meet in just a moment, were the ones who were responsible for the design and the implementation. But an entire group of technical folks at the Polis Center were continually working on this to make this an innovative technical project and not just an innovative digital encyclopedia. Uh, the I also want to, uh, to make sure that we recognize that all, all the people who have contributed to both the print version and the digital version of the encyclopedia, we counted about 800 of them. 800 people who were involved intimately in the creation of content for this. And what I want you to know and what I want everyone to recognize is that of those 800 people, more than 650 of them come from the communities of Indianapolis. They don't come from universities. They don't come, these are not scholars. They're people whose knowledge they ha who, who have an expertise that they have gained from their experience and from their passion for a subject. Reminds me that Will Rogers was right when he says, you know, we're all ignorant, just in different subjects. But, but what they have been willing to do is to share their knowledge with us through this particular thing. For that, I'm grateful. I'd like to, to call Matt Nallen and Skip Comer up here, though. They're going to be your drivers uh, through the encyclopedia. Matt has been our information designer and user experience uh, designer. And Skip has been the person who is responsible for the WordPress expression that you see on the screen. General? Thank you so much, David. Um, yeah, Skip and I have the fun part of driving you through the we, site. We have the best job. The best of the job whole thing. of all. Um, Peak of the pyramid. David said we worked on this continuously, and he's not wrong. If Skip, <laughs> if Skip falls asleep, it's because he was up till four in the morning finishing some things. So. It's true. <laughs> I don't think he will, though. Um, okay, so first we wanted to show you just sort of what's in the encyclopedia. Um, we know, of course, there are the 1,600 entries that were in the, the book, um, you know, 20, 25 years ago. Um, those are, um, to, amended to that are um, hundreds of new entries, and these entries include um, discussions on people, places, um, events, organizations, and topics. And then added to that are things that are really only possible um, in this rich expression of the digital environment. So, for example, um, timelines. We have a timeline of the history of Indianapolis, and we'll take a look at that soon. A timeline about the COVID-19 pandemic, um, which we might not need to reference right now. It's fresh in our memory. But eventually, those kind of um, current resources are going to be um, really priceless to the community, you know, 25, 50 years from now, as this lives on. Um, and finally, you know, you know, we should put something on the timeline about how we met some of our collaborators for the first time tonight. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> this has been a two-year Zoom meeting. <laughs> and finally, we have an atlas, um, which takes a uh, 
fascinating and deep dive look at our community from a lot of different angles that we don't normally uh, view it from. So we'll get into all that in more detail. Um, let me reopen my notes here. So I should have apparently started this with a look at the North Central High School entry, but I'm going <laughs> to search for Crispus Attucks High School. And our, our search engine is powered by Google, um, and so it's very effective, and we immediately come up with Crispus Attucks High School here. Um, and we can get a, a nice look at how entries work. We have, um, you know, the key information you need to know about this entry, the title, its category. You can click on this and see all the entries about places. Um, for hundreds of our entries, we also have a location that's been attached to that entry. So we can see where this is, and even in a smaller map, where it fits into the bigger context of Indianapolis. Um, these images, we have uh, thousands of images in this encyclopedia, and so many of them are drawn from partner institutions. For example, this one is a direct feed from the Indiana Historical Society. So um, I don't know if you want to chime in, but we can open this up. Click on View Source, and we'll, yeah. we'll see if they're awake. <laughs> Was great. So, if you want to know more about what uh, the Historical Society has in its library, this is your place. Yeah. So, in this way, we um, utilize all those great digital archives that are, are available in our city, and also um, drive traffic and recognition to those partners. Um, hopefully, making it even easier to find their content than it already is. We have on the right recommended entries that are um, related to this particular entry. And I'm scrolling down to find one of our links. So um, we have a kind of innovative use of links in this encyclopedia. So here I'm going to hover over a link about Freeman Ransom, um, an attorney, a famed attorney in Indianapolis, and someone who did some fundraising for Crispus Attucks um, in this particular case to get a new pipe organ for the school. Um, Skip, do you want to explain a little bit about how our links work? So we have a few databases behind the encyclopedia. Neil Devinson is uh, the one who engineered much of this. And so he knows which topics are related to which other topics. So that's why you see items over on the right side that be related to the topic that you're, that you're viewing. But also when you click on these links, you will get a little pop-up that shows you other items that are related to the thing that you have just uh, clicked on. So we can link over to, uh, I don't know if you're going to go to Ransom Place or yeah. to uh, Freeman Ransom's uh, entry. Yeah, absolutely. We'll go to Ransom Place. So in a typical um, link, like if you're on Wikipedia or something like that, you click that and you just be at Freeman Ransom's entry. Here, you actually understand there's Freeman Ransom's entry, but there's also on the neighborhood named after. And so let's visit that link and learn a little bit about Our neighborhood entries are um, special in a few ways. They have the map I mentioned, um, so you can zoom in and see what are the exact boundaries of Ransom Place. But continuing the theme of partnership, they have demographic data available for um, over 200 neighborhoods in the city. And this is drawn from the Savvy Community Information System. Savvy is a program of the Polis Center where we take data from over 70 different um, sources, local, federal, and everything in between. And so here we can see at a glance um, what the population of Ransom Place is, what the demographics are, how those have changed over time. And even following this link, we can dive deeper into that neighborhood and learn a whole world of information from air quality to crime levels to whatever you'd like to know. Um, and so that's unique to our neighborhood entries. And um, from here, we're going to, we've kind of covered how does a basic entry work, right? And we're going to learn now how to get around the encyclopedia, how to find content, how to explore it. So we've already seen the search mechanism. Um, and another important way is browsing. So if you don't quite know what you're looking for, um, the browse page has uh, entries organized by category, like people, places, events. Um, you can click on events here. You want to talk a little bit about our events page here? So we have 
several broad categories of, of entry items, uh, events being one of the bigger ones. Uh, but you'll also notice if you come in here, we also have subcategories of those as well. So if you are really interested in politics, you can filter the events for politics. Um, you can browse around through there. If you see something that looks interesting to you, you can click on it and explore that one for a while. Um, and if you want to go back, you always have a link back to the broad category at the top of the entry here. And then we have also um, browsing by subject. So if you are interested in politics, for example, and you don't care whether it's people, events, places, whatever, you can scroll through our um, subject list here and find, uh, where is it, politics. And you'll see all the entries we have related to that um, subject. And finally, I think this is very cool, browse by location. So I mentioned that there's hundreds of entries that are mapped, and we can use this map to find those entries. Um, each bubble here, you see this one says 58, right? That means there's 58 entries that are all so close together, we've kind of grouped them into one bubble. So I can click that, and we zoom in, and they split apart, and we can find individual entries. Um, if I click on one, I see the title of that entry, and I can follow that title as a link to read the entry. Now we also have this near me feature. So I have to allow my uh, browser to use my location. And then, well, so we have, well, was I already there? I see. I am where I am. That makes, that makes a lot of sense. So that's why we needed this. Um, with, so now I see the entries near the library, and when I click on this pin, I see the Indiana World War Memorial Plaza. Um, I want to visit this entry to look at a, a nice way we've connected um, to some of our other kinds of content. So we've looked at entries a lot, but I mentioned we also have timelines, atlases, and features. And so the Indiana World War Memorial Plaza entry um, has a link to, we have a ton of great information in the entry here, but we also have a feature about this topic. And a feature is like a deep dive, long form essay um, with a rich history about a particular subject. And these are highly interactive. So here, for example, in the World War Memorial, um, I personally, uh, as somebody who grew up in Indiana, took for granted like the World War Memorial probably always looked that way. It looks real old. And so, uh, always <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> this is a cool map where you can look at the difference between um, the buildings that were existing in 1916 in the plaza and um, the buildings that exist there now. And so those kind of interactive features are um, all throughout these features. So, for example, we also have like a digital walking tour of those historic buildings that were, uh, many of them torn down to make way for the, uh, the memorial. And the Memorial Plaza is one entry we have. We have four others. Um, go here, back out to features. Oh, I should mention, too, um, we have the ability to download these features as a PDF. And sometimes those PDFs are even um, more in-depth than the online version, if you need uh, more information. So we have four features published right now. And the beautiful thing about a digital encyclopedia is you can continue to publish content um, forever. And so I do want to take a look at one more, though, which is Indiana Avenue. This shows a nice um, integration of audio. Indiana Avenue music is obviously really important to that history. Um, and so if I scroll down here to the end of our chapter about um, expressive culture on the avenue, we actually have a playlist that covers um, you know, it's just a sample, 10 songs um, covering about 100 years from 1870 to 1970 of um, jazz and other music that was written or performed by um, folks who are from Indiana Avenue. Um, and very importantly, we also have some oral histories here. So three folks who um, describe their experience growing up or visiting the avenue. Um, Julian Coleman, his father was a 
was a faculty member at Crispus Attucks, and he has a beautiful story about the school. Dolores Coe, um, she um, grew up on the avenue, and her husband is actually um, a really famous saxophone player who played with um, the McShann Band, where Charlie Parker got his start. So some great stories here that are all integrated into these features. And let's see. Next, I want to take a look at the Atlas. Interrupt me if you have anything to... I, I'm just enjoying the show. Okay. <laughs> but you, you might point out there's this little uh, hamburger is what oh, we yeah. call it. Oh, yeah. Thank you. But, you know, if you want to get around the encyclopedia, if you click on that, pretty much everything that you want to know is right there, and you go straight to it. Right. So that's how I got to the Atlas. And that's also how you can get to a page to understand more about what the encyclopedia is and our user guide where you can figure out how to use it. You guys won't need that because I'm showing you how to use it right now. But... Um, if you forget, it's there. So the Atlas has a lot of, like I said, interesting perspectives from which to view um, our city that you might not otherwise, um, you know, come in contact with. So let's start with climate and environment. Um, we have, of course, some kind of infographics and things like that about um, basic climate stats in Indianapolis. What is the weather like here? Um, but we also have some information that until now is really hard to, to, come, to come by, right, in, in one integrated platform. What's the air quality like? What's the water quality like? Um, and so here we see a quick chart comparing particulate matter in Indianapolis to other major cities nearby. Um, it's kind of good news. It's going down. That's good. Particulate matter, by the way, is like tiny things that come out of power plants, farm fields, exhaust and it really hurts your lungs. So it's bad news, and it's good that we have less of it than we used to. But we also have more than these other cities, so that's not good. Um, but this kind of information is, you know, to the layperson, really difficult to find. We display it here in easy to understand, and sometimes beautiful and fascinating um, graphs. Also, water quality. This is um, another chance to point out our partnerships. So we worked with um, Gabe Filippelli, an environmental scientist at IUPUI, um, to put together these maps that let everyday people dig deep into um, complicated data about water quality samples from our creeks, our reservoirs, and things like that. Um, for example, I always had heard that um, that Eagle Creek had like low levels of oxygen and algae was a problem. And here you can actually see in this in this map um, what the ox oxygen level like samples are for different parts of Eagle Creek Reservoir. So. We're really happy to be able to surface all that great information for the public. Um, we have, this was just one topic, right? And if you want to view more, you can sort of turn the page, digitally speaking. Clicking to the right will open up the population atlas. And clicking again, we see the utilities and resources atlas. I love this one because utilities and resources are something we all take for granted. You switch on the light, and it's on. You flush the toilet, and it's gone. Um, but behind the scenes, there's a ton of work that goes into making all those systems happen, right? And this uh, part of the atlas really tries to expose that. So, for example, when you flush the toilet, it's got to come out somewhere. And if you use this interactive map, you can see... Um, exactly. Yeah, this is a well field. <laughs> this is, yeah, exactly where. So... Um, where you don't want to go swimming. Yeah, you? exactly. <laughs> We treat it before it comes out, though, okay. Um, I think this map is also fascinating. This is all the power plants in our state. So here's our um, Harding Street plant. All these little green dots represent like small solar plants. The bigger the dot, the more power it produces. So I find this fascinating. And when you zoom out to the whole state, you can see um, what I thought was a big power plant, Harding Street, pales in comparison to um, Gibson and some of the other coal plants in the southern part of the state. So all, again, information that's difficult to find and here surfaced easily and understandably for the public. Um, and finally, we want to look at timelines. Let's look at the timeline. You want to talk to us about timelines a little bit, Skip? I can talk about timelines a okay. little bit. Okay. Let me get to them. So we have all this information, and it has dates, right? So what happened when? Uh, we have worked out a way to organize those items into uh, uh, a really 
nice to, to read graphic form. We have four right now. We expect to be doing others as, uh, as we get further into this. But the one that's most interesting is the Indianapolis timeline. It was just interesting to me just because it goes back such a long way. Uh, all the way to 1816. And you can scroll through here, and we've got great photos to accompany these entries. Uh, for example, here's the one about uh, as, when the city was laid out. You know, the surveyors who, who did the uh, mile square plan, et cetera. Um, but if you don't want to scroll all the way from 1820 to, uh, to 1960 or, or 1950 or so, you can use this little uh, index up here, which is so fascinating. I just like to run my mouse back and forth. <laughs> That's just what I do all day. <laughs> OK. So if we click on 1950, we can come to a photo that I know you wanted to talk about. Oh, uh, sure. I don't have much to say about it, <laughs> but I just enjoy the fact that Hank Aaron we, played we for the Clowns. We did yesterday. We... <laughs> um, yeah, absolutely. And so not only does it go really far back in time, but a really important thing we wanted to point out here is that it comes right up to the present day. So if I go to the 2020s, and here's the Netflix documentary we talked about. Um, but if I scroll all the way down to the bottom, we have as recently as um, September 26th, when Banker's Life was renamed um, Gainbridge. And it's so new I had to look at the screen again to remember what it was renamed. So, and I didn't, I didn't even know what happened until <laughs> yesterday. So. I point this out because it's really something special about the digital version of the encyclopedia. It's not only our story in terms of the past, but in terms of the present. And it's continuously updated. Um, and so it's going to be uh, just a priceless resource going on to the, into the future. I'll just go back here. And that one, so I'll go. show you guys what I was... Uh doing until four in the morning okay. last night. <laughs> David mentioned that we have hundreds of people who have contributed to the encyclopedia, and that is absolutely true. Uh, we have a list of all the contributors in this author's page here, and there were so many that we couldn't even get them all on one page. We have to go through them uh, letter by letter. Uh, and then when you... Uh, when you come to one, let me find a good one here that uh, will take me somewhere I want to I want to be. Let's see what Joan Cunningham did. Is Joan here tonight? If she is, I want her to know that her photo is linked to the right place now. She was unhappy about that earlier, but I fixed it. <laughs> but these these are the articles that Joan contributed just herself. And this is not the longest list. There are many, many others that uh, just go on and on and on. So we have just a huge number of people who have uh, been a part of this. And uh, if, you, if you just want to take a look at a who's who for who is involved, uh, you can see it all right here and, uh, and find your friends and, and see what they did. I mean, I'm going to contact my agent. You guys need to go on the road. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Yeah, one of the things that they did not point out that I'm sure you saw on the screen was a box on every entry that says contribute. And this means that if you spot an error, and yes, there are going to be errors in this, if you see something, an entry that you know is not as fully described as it should be, you click on that box. It takes you to a form where you can fill it out. It goes directly to the editorial team. The editorial team will look at that, respond to you immediately, ask you perhaps for more information. But this is a way we have of trying to keep this encyclopedia fresh. You may suggest new topics, but this is a, this is a launch party. This means that we're beginning a journey, not ending a journey. And to help us understand what that journey is likely to mean for the city, I'm delighted to uh, welcome and to introduce Sarah, uh, Honorable Sarah, uh, Sarah Evans Barker, uh, our, one of our co-chairs of the Civic Advisory Committee. She needs no introduction. We have known Sarah for a long time. 
She's been instrumental and a, a major leader in this city for as long as I've been here, and I'm sure longer. Sarah. Some of you I know think that my involvement is part of the comic relief that they found a role for a Luddite uh, <laughs> who knows so little about technology that it's embarrassing to s stand up here after Matt and Skip did their wonderful presentation. Uh, but the joke's not just on me because it's on some of you tonight because as I was able to see many of you in the reception and now I see all of you from here. I know there's some of you who haven't been in a library since before college. <laughs> and <laughs> it's really a tribute to technology that that's what got you out here today. So that'll break your streak, your streak of saying, no, no, library. I didn't know where the library was when I was in college. Now you can say I was there once. <laughs> Uh, in the library. Now usually when a judge speaks last, somebody's going to go to jail. Uh, and that might happen tonight depending on your demeanor. Uh, but that's not the intention of my remarks tonight. Uh, so I have written down what I want to say because I want to stay within the allotted five minutes. Hopefully you can stay with me five more minutes here. Uh, and allow me to explain to you about the um, Citizen Advisory Committee. My role is to speak briefly about the Citizen Advisory Committee, which along with Rick Fusen, who's here, over here someplace, uh, and Lacey Johnson, uh, the three of us were honored to co-chair uh, this project. Uh, others uh, have mentioned the Citizens Advisory Committee, David in particular, uh, and the work that we did, uh, the work that we oversaw in getting the encyclopedia updated and uh, relaunched. So I'm not going to repeat all those particulars of our work, but I do want to say this, that it was really a great pleasure, a unique pleasure for me to work uh, with such an astute and civic-minded group of community leaders, those people whose names were uh, listed up here by Matt and Skip to be within their sphere of expertise uh, and their, uh, their imaginations, uh, their literary abilities and so forth, uh, to make sure that what we did in compiling the encyclopedia was objective and inclusive and comprehensive. So when you have a chance to review the end product, I'm confident that you'll find that there's convincing evidence uh, that the committee was successful uh, in our work. So Rick and Lacey and I want to add our thanks to each of these people who have participated so fulsomely and give our kudos as well to David Bodenhamer and to Jackie Needus who gave such extraordinary leadership. So my remarks this evening are to highlight uh, the fact that what has been created and is what is being inaugurated here this evening is truly the city's encyclopedia. It's a gift. It's a gift we're giving to all of our citizens. We give it with the intent that it serve all and that it be viewed by all as belonging to all. You'll get a fuller sense of the scope of this project when you consider as well its ennobling purpose, which is on an ongoing and perpetual basis to collect and recount the stories that have made and continue to make us who we are as a city, to record our sentinel events occurring within our community, community that have shaped our identity and borne the weight of our progress, and to remember and to honor and to hold up as examples those remarkable people, those hundreds, those thousands of remarkable people whose investments of time and talent and energy and imagination, their resources and their affection, they have led us in the past and they still inspire us today and infuse our life together. Winston Churchill observed that the farther you can look back, 
the farther you can look forward. That means that the knowledge of what we have been in the past helps us divine who we are now and determine what we can become in the future, just exactly what our mayor said this evening. Maintaining this backward, forward perspective is the obligation and the opportunity that is extended to our entire community, each one of us. It is a process which should engage each citizen. And it makes of each citizen a stakeholder as well as a storyteller. So the primary purpose, the primary purpose of the Encyclopedia of Indianapolis, as the Citizen Advisory Committee came to see from our uh, close in, first hand, uh, front row perspective, and a perspective that we hope that others will see and appreciate as well in accessing the many resources of the encyclopedia. What we came to see is that the purpose must be to facilitate the process of looking back and looking forward for the benefit of all of our citizens. That's the purpose of this project. So if the encyclopedia manages to deliver on this promise, here's how we'll be able to measure success. Here's our accountability measure. This is how we'll know. Besides collecting and celebrating our remarkable past, the process of gathering in and retelling our history in the context of the encyclopedia will sharpen our collective focus as to the issues that we face going forward as a city. It will help us identify our best assets and encourage us to devise new ways to deploy them. It will develop a mutuality of interests among us and for us on which we can build a new set of community structures with expanded and enriching opportunities for progress. It will strengthen our resolve to address our shortcomings, and we have those. Part of what we said to each other in this process is we have to be honest about who we are and where we are and where we're going. So this process will help strengthen our resolve to address our shortcomings and our failures with candor and with devotion and with solidarity. And it will inspire us towards greater levels of individual fulfillment of education, of economic and educational and scientific and industrial and cultural attainment and instill in all our efforts, in all of our efforts, a deeper sense of fairness and equity and justice for all as we seek to shape and refine our ever-evolving sense of identity. The highest and best use of the encyclopedia of Indianapolis will be achieved when it is able to help all our people understand and appreciate who we are, why we are the way we are, and who we want to be together. In the eloquent words of the author Joan Didion, I thought in the library I should come up with an author. <laughs> so I'm using Joan, Joan Didion's words, but it's as if she wrote them for us. I was thrilled to find them, see what you think. Her words underscore the importance of what the digital launch of this newly revised version of Indianapolis's autobiography, you might say, represents. Here are Joan Didion's words. She says, a place, meaning a place like our city, a place like Indianapolis, belongs forever to whoever claims it hardest, remembers it most obsessively, wrenches it from itself, shapes it, renders it, loves it so radically that he remakes it in his own image. Oh, Joan. <laughs> so maybe each of, each of us take Joan's words as our own mission statement, do all that we can to claim hard this place, this place that we call home. May we remember it obsessively. 
May we wrench it and shape it and render it and love it, always love it. In all the good ways that bind us together and fuel a shared future that is worthy, worthy of our telling and our living and our affections. I have every confidence that this newly compiled digital encyclopedia of Indianapolis will enhance our journey together. It's something we've done that's good. So you may be proud of it, as I am. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Roberta Jaggers, and I'm the president of the Indianapolis Public Library Foundation. And um, I'm really honored and excited to be here tonight with all of you as our several members of our board of directors and our advisory committee, because tonight is the culmination, and as David said, also the beginning of so much effort, of so many gifts that have been contributed by countless individuals to get us to a point where we have a resource that can really build our future. Um, as the encyclopedia tells us, philanthropy has been a major force behind our city's development. And the same thing is true of the encyclopedia. This is just one more way in which our encyclopedia is a microcosm of our city. And building a resource of this magnitude has taken countless volunteer hours from authors and from experts and community leaders to create the content. And it has also taken a lot of money. Um, it has taken a startup investment of about $2.17 million. The Polis Center and the library and the library foundation have been collaborating on this fundraising part for about two years. And it's been a great partnership. I've really enjoyed it and I've really learned a lot from it. And thanks to everyone's hard work, I'm happy to say that tonight we are within $50,000 of our goal, our initial goal. And I'm going to say what initial means in a little bit. But so we're very excited about this. And uh, Kira earlier was so kind to acknowledge our major sponsors, but I'm going to do it again because that's what we do as fundraisers. And so Lily Endowment, first and foremost, has just been phenomenal. Uh, the Allen Whitehill Clues Charitable Foundation, the R.B. Annis Educational Foundation, the Indianapolis Foundation Library Fund, the Nicholas H. Noyes Jr. Memorial Foundation, Jackie Nitas, who has just continued to be such an amazing champion for this project. And also, we have a very generous anonymous donor. And I also want to be sure to acknowledge that in addition to the intellect and the care, that we just saw displayed earlier from our Civic Advisory Committee that many of them have also generously contributed financially. And we've gotten gifts from other individuals who share our passion for the city. So if you haven't already contributed in a financial way, I think everyone in this room has contributed in another way, one way or another, but if you have yet to contribute in the financial way, this is your night, okay? <laughs> so even though the encyclopedia has launched, just like David said, this is just the beginning, this is not the end. And we are always looking to add new content, and your gift will help us to do that. So as I mentioned, we're less than $50,000 away from our initial goal. And to be honest with you, we're already um, thinking about how we could attract even more funding based upon some of the terrific ideas that our um, editorial team has begun to develop. And I just want you all to know that if you're inclined, making a gift is very easy. So all you can do is just text EOI to 317-967-9287. And if you forgot that number, it's also in your program. And you'll receive a link to our online giving portal. And in there, you can just make a, a gift really securely and conveniently online. And if you have any questions, you can also call us. Our phone number is in there. And of course, I'll be around this evening. So if anybody has any further questions about giving, you're welcome to contact me. If we miss each other, David and Jackie or John can help us connect. And so I just want to just thank you all for the time 
and the many gifts that you have given to this project. And I just hope that this evening you'll also consider the financial kind if you haven't done that already. And I'm ready now to hand things back over to Kira and Steve to close out our evening. Thank you. Thanks, Roberta. Uh, before we close, just want to give you three quick uh, uh, housekeeping notes. Uh, one, we encourage you to uh, test drive the encyclopedia yourself outside. Um, uh, and there'll be some folks around to, to, to kind of show you how to do that. Um, you can also learn more about the partner organizations with the Digital Encyclopedia of Indianapolis um, on the shelves in the Simon Reading Room. Uh, and then also there's a, uh, a, a gift for you upon your departure, so make sure you pick that up. Once again, thanks to all of our funders, our partner organizations, the Bicentennial Commission, Mayor Hogsett, our speakers tonight. Uh, we're so happy to see so many of you uh, uh, here today. And we can't end without thanking all of you for your amazing contributions to this project. That was the main reason Steve and I wanted to be here tonight is to thank all of you because this is phenomenal and it's going to be a great legacy for our city. Thank you. Good night.